Good morning, everybody. This is a little different as we are just live streaming the Sabbath School lesson for this morning. And actually, you know, it doesn't feel so different from regular Sabbath School when we start. Unfortunately, I wish it was a lot different, but it's um, not quite so different. We'll have maybe a faithful seven here at the start of Sabbath School, and by the end of Sabbath School, we have. 30 plus or more, but so this is a little um, a little different in that we're just going to be live streaming the Sabbath School lesson. And so we are in the book of Daniel. We're starting to get to the close. This is lesson 11 and uh, we're studying Daniel 10. But by way of review we want to pick up in Daniel 9, which we did not finish last Sabbath and uh, one of the most important parts of Daniel 9, we need to finish up today. So as we start, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your blessings on us. And that even though our church is closed physically, that we still have the gift of live streaming, the gift of technology that you have given to this church so that we can continue to communicate your word to our members and to anyone who may be tuning in and listening and searching for truth. So we ask you to bless our time together as we open your word. And if you have promised where two or three are gathered together and we have at least that this morning, that you will be there and we claim that promise and thank you for being with us. Lead us and guide us into your truth and say in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we want to take up from last Sabbath lesson, and there was one interesting uh, gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man and then present the subject to the angels of God as acting a part in the salvation of the human soul or in merit, the proposition would be rejected as treason. Wow. We were to present the of man as acting a part in our salvation, it would be treason. That's pretty serious. Right? I mean, what do we think of as treason? You know, we think of treason as uh, working against you know, a government, trying to overthrow government, trying to uh, betray it, to uh, work against it. A betrayal. This idea of salvation by human merit, salvation by works is another way of, of saying it, would be treason. And why would that be treason? That's the question. Why would it be treason? I mean, it certainly could be wrong, but why would it be treason? And uh, thinking about that, I'm going like, well, because it sustains, we're talking about it would be treason, in other words, betraying uh, loyalty to God's government, God's way of salvation. And so when we offer man's works or merits or goodness as a way of obtaining his salvation, it's basically sustaining Satan's, Satan's government, right? Satan's government says you need to do good things to make God happy with you so that he will save you, so that he will bless you. He will not harm you. He will not punish you. 
He will bless me. And so all we're doing is sustaining Satan's charge. And that is that God is someone who needs to be appeased, which is a, a paganistic view of God. But sometimes I wonder if we do any better when we say, well, it's not our merits that earn our salvation. It's Christ's merits instead. It's Christ's merits that earn us our salvation. And that is offered to God instead of our good works. God's, his, safe, uh, his son's, or Jesus' good works. You know. for station identification. <laughs> <laughs> Something's working. Yeah. You can kind of may not be going over the internet. <laughs> it's working in here. <laughs> All right, we good now? Yeah. Oh, that's better. So the thought is that, yes, we can look at it and say that Alfred, man, our, our merits, our goodness is kind of paganistic. But on the other hand, is offering Christ's merits and his goodness to God any better? You know, is that any better? We've, we've substituted our righteousness and goodness for Christ's righteousness and goodness that needs to be offered to God. It could be the same paganistic view that instead of offering our merits and our righteousness and goodness to the Father, Christ offers his goodness to the Father in our place. But it still paints God as the same paganistic God that needs to be satisfied somehow with either death or blood or merits, right? It doesn't, it doesn't do any good. So we need to really change our view of what the merits of Christ's righteousness mean for our salvation. So those merits need to be in us. They need to be in us. It's not something that needs to appease God. It needs to bring us. We need to be brought back into harmony with God through Christ's merits, through his righteousness that is given to us as a gift and enlarged and grown and developed in us. Well, let's go on to, that was that's a statement that I wanted to go on, but what we uh, ended up at in Daniel 9 was the 70 weeks. Which, which I think is the, is, the, is the crux of all of these prophecies of Daniel. Because if you don't, it, it's this that gives you the key to the rest of it. So let's go to Daniel 9. Daniel 9, verse 24. So this is uh, Gabriel bringing an answer to Daniel. And uh, this is following up on Daniel 8 which has to do with the 2300-day prophecy, right? The 2300-day prophecy, and then the sanctuary will be, quotes, cleansed, which isn't really the proper term. It really means literally to be set right. The sanctuary will be set right. So Daniel cannot go on because he's so distraught or so overcome 
thinking maybe that, oh no, what is this? I thought we're close to 70 years and Israel will be restored back to Jerusalem and the temple will be rebuilt and Jerusalem will be rebuilt and the people will return and what are you talking about 2300 days before the sanctuary will be restored will be set right and so Gabriel can't finish because this is all that Daniel can take and so now Gabriel comes back and returns and he says, I have now come forth, back in 22, verse 22, I have now come forth to give you insight with understanding. At the beginning of your supplications, a command was issued, and I have come to tell you. About what? About the vision of Daniel 8. So he goes right into it. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression." To make an end of sin, to make atonement for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Now, if we look at the beginning of the prophecy in Genesis 3, where God says, I will send... I will, I will make enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. But then that a specific seed, he will crush the serpent's head, even though the serpent would bruise the seed's heel. Looking forward to what? The crucifixion. The crucifixion would occur on Calvary, the place of the skull. When Jesus was crucified, literally driven into the skull. Since that prophecy, there's been this chess game in a way, this match between God and Satan. Satan wanted to prevent this from happening and God working to make it happen. We see that down through history. Of Satan trying to wipe out any possible deliverer and God still finding a way. Still finding a way. <clears throat> Focusing from a family to a nation to a tribe to a person's lineage, David. But here it's not just who and even where, <coughs> it's now when. And so here in Daniel, Daniel 9, God is now giving the time. The actual time. So now Satan can hone in on the time. Seventy weeks have been decreed for your people. <laughs> Literally it means seventy weeks have been cut off. Cut off. For your people. The, which people? Daniel's people. That would be Israel. And your holy city, Jerusalem. To finish the transgression. To make an end of sin. To make atonement for iniquity. To bring in everlasting righteousness. So. What is the 70 weeks a part of? See, the 70 weeks can be also be derived from the term either seven consecutive days or even a Sabbath of years. A Sabbath of years. Seventy weeks. <clears throat> now when you try to put all of this together as how this is fulfilled, this is pointing eventually to the Messiah. So, verse 25, so you are to know and discern that from the issue of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat even in times of distress. Then after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And the people of the Prince 
who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and its end will come with the flood. Even to the end there will be war. Desolations of return. Verse 27. And he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. All right, so now we have a starting point. The starting point says, from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That means that makes 69. Where is the 70 weeks? Well, it says, and he will make, in verse 27, he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week. That's how you get the 70. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and go on. So now, how do we date this? There were actually three decrees made to help restore the temple and Jerusalem. The first was done by Cyrus himself in, four, in 537 BC. Another one was done by Darius the Mede in 5, actually a, a Persian, 520 BC later. And then a final one, a third one by Artaxerxes in 457 BC. How do we know which one? How do we, know, how do we pick? And Satan has to guess. This is kind of an interesting thing. Satan's got to get, well, I don't know which one is it going to be? Well, that was the first one, and he has to start calculating. If he works out, okay, a day is a year, a year, you know, this means 490 years from this decree. So 490 years from 537 BC would be way BC. Oh, there's another decree that occurs 17 years later by Darius. This is that one. Is there going to be a recalculation? And so finally, there's a third decree. Now, we, we, we go off the third decree for a number of reasons. One, the 457 BC. One is, is that it was the one that gave full autonomy to the country. This is the one that restored not only the city physically, but also Israel politically, socially, its government. They were, they were, their function, they were able to function as a country, practically independent, still having to pay taxes, still having to be under Persian rule, but they had some more autonomy than the prior decrees. But really, what really cinches it is the fulfillment, is the timing. See, it's the timing. For, if you look at, here's a depiction on this uh, timeline I drew here. If we go by 457 BC as the decree that would be counted, there were seven weeks, which would be 49 years, if you go a day equals a year. Seven weeks has 49 days, be 49 years. And 62 weeks, that makes 69 weeks, or 483 days, or 483 years. You come down to 27 AD. And what happened in 27 AD? Then we have the week, the 70th week, which would go from 27 AD to 34 AD. This now comprises the whole 70 weeks that are a part of the 2300 days prophecy. So now we know the beginning of both because the 70 weeks are cut off from the 2300 days. The beginning of the 70 weeks is also the beginning of the 2300 day prophecy. After the 69 weeks, it says, they will, God would make a firm covenant. A firm covenant. With many for one week. That's seven years. But in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice. In 27 AD, the date of Jesus' baptism. And so 
so therefore, it's right exactly the one week. And then, in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrificing grain on it. This refers to the crucifixion. At Christ's death, he put an end to sacrifices. They were no longer needed because he was the one that all the sacrifices pointed to. He was the fulfillment. His death was the fulfillment of all the sacrifices that had been offered in faith, looking forward to this actual event. In the middle of the week, so in the spring, this is the fall of A.D. 27, the spring of A.D. 31, three and a half years, exactly in the middle of the week, Christ dies on Passover. Literally on Passover. Exactly in the middle of the week. The 70 weeks ends in 34 A.D. What happened in 34 A.D.? Now, you know, I... I I try to find where that was. The stoning of Stephen. We say that the stoning of Stephen. Well, how do we know the stoning of Stephen occurred in 34 AD? There's no Bible text. There's no Bible text to date it. It doesn't say uh, three and a half years after Christ was crucified, Stephen was killed. How do we know that? Well, it's kind of interesting that if you look up Christian records or historical records about Stephen, they do have him living until 34 AD. He was born somewhere about 6 to 10 AD and he dies in 34 AD. So there's some historical record of some sort that substantiate that he died in 34 AD. But if you look at the gospel record from Acts, you notice that something very interesting happens when he dies. Because he gives this long speech of the whole history of the Jewish nation. From when God delivered them from Egypt and brought them out and gave them the land of Canaan. And how they rejected all of his prophets. And even gets down to he rejected his son. Stephen is recounting all of this history. And what happens? They're up in arms. They reject that message. And they kill Stephen for giving that message. And Stephen's last vision is, Behold, I see Christ at the right hand of God. Standing at the right hand of God. And they kill him. And after that, the gospel goes to the Gentiles. That's the next recording. The gospel is spread away and outside to Samaria and other places on the earth. So it does lead us to believe that definitely the stoning of Stephen marked the end of the time that the Israel was given their role to play and they rejected it. Those are the 70 weeks that were cut off for Israel in regards to the Messiah. And so when you look at this fulfillment, the literal fulfillment to the year, to the date from Daniel's prophecy, it gives you great confidence to realize what is going on. And that God is really true. This prophecy is amazing that if we done that far ahead, and come down to the exact time and exact circumstances. So, that brings us to the 2300 days. And you go, well, if this ended in the fall of 457 BC, you go all the way down, 2300 years is going to be the fall of 1844. And so, there was something significant that happened in the fall of 1844. There was certainly something significant on this planet. And so I would look at it as not some necessarily any kind of a uh, actual cleaning event that goes on, either on earth or in heaven. 
who has mistakenly thought that this earth was going to be the sanctuary and it was going to be cleansed, therefore it meant that Jesus was coming in 1844. But as a result of the focus in 1844, the sanctuary itself is the sanctuary focus, the sanctuary truth. The whole idea of the great controversy about the law of God and the character of God and people being sanctuaries. Out of that happening of 1844, I think, we have a focus now on the sanctuary and what it really means and our part to play in the sanctuary and God's role to play in regards to our atonement and our getting back and reconciling to God. That, the truth about that now becomes a lot more clear. And that's where a function of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is to proclaim that, to teach that, to tell about that, to focus on that in regards to God's character, and to help bring people back to Him and to be ready for His coming. Well, let's go to Daniel 10. for our lesson today. And uh, Daniel 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel who was named Belteshazzar. And the message was true and one of great conflict. But he understood the message and had an understanding of the vision. In those days, verse 2 of Daniel 10, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. How many days is that? 21 days. I did not eat any tasty food, nor did meat or wine enter my mouth, nor did I use any ointment at all until the entire three weeks were complete. So Daniel is serious. He is serious. He is mourning and fasting and praying. He did not eat any tasty food. Does that mean he was vegan? Tasty uh, vegan cannot be tasty. Uh, <laughs> What does that mean, that he did not eat any tasty food? Okay. It was not <clears throat> the rich, spicy, whatever food. He did not eat meat or wine. Did he even eat that in the beginning? You know, if he, if he stayed with what he did back in Daniel 1, he wasn't eating that anyway. He already was plant-based. So is there, why fast? You know, I, I, I kind of, why do we fast? Or why do people fast? Is there a purpose? Would God not answer our prayers if we didn't fast? Again, it goes into your concept about God. You know, is fasting something you do for God? Or is, is fasting something you do for yourself? Is fasting something that, like an extra bonus point to get God to listen to you more seriously? Like, okay, I'll, okay, you must be serious now because you're a fasting, so I will listen to you and I will pay more attention to you. Is that what fasting is designed to do? Is to get God to have more attention to us? Or to have greater influence on God to change his mind or make him to do what we want? No. Again, it depends on how you look at God. If you look at God as some person who needs to be appeased or uh, made more interested in you or something like that, then, okay, you need, to, you need to have that kind of concept. But if God really is a God who loves you and cares for you, and as you can see, responds right at the beginning, when the words are out of his mouth, God is responding. He's already listening. Even from the very first day, much less into the or more into the into the twenty first day. Fasting is more for our benefit, right? 
Fasting is, 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 is getting really serious. And how many people fast for 21 days? How many people focus on God and try to cut out everything to focus on God for 21 days? For even a day? How about a half a day? How about an hour? Where you just focus on God. I mean, can you pray for one hour? Without getting distracted? Without your cell phone going off? Well, want to go to the internet? Watch TV? Go do something? Some errand you have to do? This is, fasting is a way of focusing. Of removing all the extraneous things that would distract us from listening and being attuned and being more receptive to God. It doesn't have to be necessarily things that we eat or drink, but certainly the things that we eat or drink affect our minds, affect the clarity of our minds. <clears throat> we know that fasting increases brain activity and alertness, and that it increases memory and learning is enhanced by fasting. That intermittent fasting enhances the ability of the neurons to connect, makes them more um, developed. There is a chemical in the brain called brain-derived neurotropic factor. And it's what's it's a, like a fertilizer. It stimulates the growth of new nerves and the branches of the nerves to connect with each other. And that's what fasting does, is it increases BDNF. You can get it also through exercise. There are various things that will increase this factor that will increase brain capacity to learn and to retain and to connect. We don't know all the reasons why this happens because it does slow down oxidation, it does slow down inflammation in the brain. It does a number of things but it all works towards enhancing brain function, brain function. So we know that there's a very tight connection between the physical and the mental and the spiritual. And this is why we pay attention to the health of our bodies for that reason. And this is why fasting is something that is helpful, very helpful. You can have physical fasting, but you can also have mental fasting and spiritual fasting in which you're focusing and you know, that's one of the reasons for going into the wilderness is to re re eliminate all those distractions. Other people. Other people can distract you, right? And they can be good people. They can be wanting to do, you know, have you good, do good things, but it's still a distraction. It's still taking you away from that real focus on God and being able to listen to God. <clears throat> Just the regular busyness of life can do this too. So we have kind of a general application here <clears throat> in regards to Israel and Babylon, and the walls and the temple. There's a spiritual application here. Israel was literally captive to Babylon. Daniel was concerned about that. He was praying about this, about the restoration of Jerusalem and the restoration of the temple. <clears throat> In Babylon, Israel represented God's true people. And Babylon, that held them captive, represented Confusion, confusion, spiritual confusion. A system in which God's people were captured to and were having to deal with. And because they misrepresented God, they were in captivity. They were in captivity. So the Temple of Jerusalem represents God and his plan of salvation. 
And that's why Daniel is wanting that to be restored. The temple in Jerusalem, the plan of salvation, how we are reunited with God, how are we are reconciled with God, how can we be at one, atonement, at one with Him again? The whole plan of salvation was worked out in the services of the temple in the sanctuary. And the walls of Jerusalem representing the law of God. And so today, the Christian church even is still captive. We are in the world that has many different ideas about salvation and about God, and it is confusing, and even the Christian church and even the Seventh-day Adventist church sometimes is confused because of the mixed messages it gives out in its idea of salvation and God. And this confusion is not helpful. Is not helpful. Isaiah talks about repairs of the breach. And it follows it with a very interesting verses. And this is from Great Controversy. The prophet, that is Isaiah, thus points out the ordinance which has been forsaken. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach. Let's talk about the breach in the walls. The restorer paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. This is verses 12 to 14. This prophecy also applies in our time. The breach was made in the law of God when the Sabbath was changed by the Roman power. But the time has come for that divine institution to be restored. The breach is to be repaired and the foundation of many generations to be raised up. So this is very interesting. That in repairing the breach, it has something to do with the Sabbath, but it's, call, it's, not, it's not which day you keep, it's how you keep it. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath from doing your own pleasure, and you can call the Sabbath a delight instead of a burden, the holy of the Lord honorable and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. This is how is the Sabbath is kept, not whether you keep the seventh day Sabbath or not. And this prophecy also applies in our time. The breach was made in the law of God, when the Sabbath was changed by the Roman power. It does not say that the breach was the change of the Sabbath. It says when the Sabbath was changed. So how is it possible for the church to change the day from Sabbath, seventh-day Sabbath, to the first day Sunday? How is that possible? How is that possible? And it has to do with the breach created in the law of God. Well, if you look at the law of God as something that is arbitrary, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, the seventh day Sabbath. It's because I said so. It's a commandment. It's arbitrary. If you look at God's law as arbitrary, something he just picked out, something he designed and he commanded, therefore you must do it because he said so. And it's an arbitrary thing that he's imposing on us for no other reason than he is the creator, he is God, and he is in control, and he is sovereign. Then, yes, it can be changed. Because it's arbitrary. You just pick this day, okay. Well, no, let's pick this day instead. So when the law is looking up, looked at as imposed and arbitrary, it can be changed. Right? There's nothing inherent about it that 
means that it can't be changed because it was just arbitrary in the first place. That's when we've gotten to the breach in the law, is when we start thinking of God's law as imposed law, because once you think of God's law as imposed on us, now it makes God arbitrary. It makes God the one who's got to monitor whether you keep his law or not, and even punish you if you break the law. Nothing in the law inherently in and of itself is bad. It's just that you have offended the lawgiver, the lawmaker. <clears throat> that is the fundamental shift in change in the view of the law, that it makes the breach in the law and it makes the change from Sabbath, seventh day to the first day, Sunday, possible. The breach was made when the Sabbath was changed. And you can only make that when you have that mindset change of what the law is. That does nothing but help Satan's view of God that he wants us to believe. That God is arbitrary, that God is a dictator, that he imposes this law on us that we must obey, and if we don't, then it demands that we be punished. The wages of sin is death. You transgress the law, you must die. And so therefore, God must kill you because it's arbitrary. As opposed to looking at design law, which says, if you're not in harmony with the laws of life, which is the laws of love and truth and freedom, you cut yourself off from the source of life and you die. The wages of sin are death. The consequences of separating yourself from the source of life are death. It is a natural consequence. God does not need to kill you. You will die. You only exist because God continues to sustain you. You would have died long before now if God had not sustained you. If God had not sustained Satan, he would, he would be dead. So we need to look at this completely different. And what does the Sabbath reveal about God? You know, it says you should call the Sabbath a delight. That is not something you can command. That is not something you can legislate. You will be happy on this day. It's just, like, it's just like commanding someone to love somebody. That's not something that can be commanded. It only can be elicited. Elicited. And the same thing about calling the Sabbath a delight. If we look at Sabbath as only an arbitrary test by God to say, okay, the good people worship on the seventh-day Sabbath, and those who don't, they don't get it. They're lost. Well, we have some hard facts to look at because the Jews who crucified Jesus were kept the Sabbath. They kept the seventh-day Sabbath. So it's not about observing and worshiping on the correct day. It's how we worship. It's the God of the Sabbath that we worship that's important. They were killing the Lord of the Sabbath, getting his body off the cross to keep the Sabbath. We must be keeping the Sabbath out of an appreciation of God and his character. And what does the Sabbath tell us? <clears throat> you know, if you look back, it's a memorial of creation. If you look back at creation, you have to understand what God did when he created us. And what he answered about Satan's charges against God. If, if Satan is going around telling the angels, God is just lording it over you, he doesn't really care about you. You know, as long as you obey and do everything he says, everything will be happy. But if you don't, it's not going to be good for you. And I've got a better way. I've got a better way for you to exist. You don't need to follow God. But when you look at how God created us, a new species of, of, of beings, opposite genders, that could come together and procreate and make other human beings? What does that say about God? When man is given dominion over the whole planet and over all the other creatures that he created, the birds of the air and the creatures in the waters and all the creatures on the land, what does that tell you about God and his willingness to give dominion to other beings? That had not maybe been seen before. 
And so even though we just see this display of God's power where he can just speak things into existence, God reveals at creation and in through the Sabbath that, yes, I have all this power, but look what I've done with this power. I have given it over. I've given dominion to human beings. I've given them the ability to procreate. I've given them marvelous mental abilities and capacities to develop and to invent and to create. What does that say about God? And that's what we can embrace on Sabbath. It's a time for us to reflect on God and his power, but on his character, on how he used that power. And we can have that direct relationship with him. Have access to the tree of life. All of these things God created. And beside all of that, after doing all of that, still gives us the freedom of choice. That he's not forcing us to love him. He's not forcing us to worship him. He still gives us the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We have the ability to develop that moral capacity to choose God, but we also have the freedom to not choose him, to reject him. That says a whole lot about the character of God, that he's a God of power, yes, but a God of love. His, his power comes through truth and love and freedom. I like this uh, analogy someone said about the Sabbath. <clears throat> the Sabbath was created for humanity. It is a gift, a blessing to us, but it also is an evidence to the entire universe of God's methods and character. It is like an engagement ring. The engagement ring is a gift to the woman, but it is also an evidence to the entire world of their engagement. And the Sabbath is the same thing. Remember, it says, the Sabbath is a sign between me and you that I'm the one that makes you holy. It's a sign. It's like a ring. It's a gift, but it is also an evidence of a relationship that we have with God. And that's what the Sabbath is. By observing the Sabbath, by calling it a delight, by worshiping God as he is revealed through his son, Jesus Christ, and through what he did at creation, we can embrace that time and worship God truly and really take delight in saying all that we have to do to say and what we want to do on Sabbath is really immaterial. What we really want to do is devote ourselves to God because he is the one that makes us holy. It's his presence in our lives that makes us holy. And so we can enjoy that time. And that's how we repair the breach. We repair the breach by looking at the Sabbath as the true way that God reveals his character, not as an arbitrary dictator demanding worship on the seventh day Sabbath. <clears throat> and that's why there's this link between the repair of the breach and calling the Sabbath a delight in Isaiah 58, 12, 13 and 14. Well, let's close with going back to Daniel 10. <clears throat> Daniel 10. So Daniel had been fasting and praying in mourning for three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, this is Daniel 10:4. When I was by the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, some translations have the Euphrates. It seems to be there's probably a joining of the Tigris and the Euphrates where he was. Verse 5, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Ephes. His body also was like beryl. Some translations say topaz. His face had the appearance of lightning. His eyes were like flaming torches. His arms and feet like the gleam of polished bronze and the sounds of his words like the sound of a tumult. Who do you think this is? Yeah. Who do you think this is? Well, if you look at Revelation 1, if you look at Revelation 1, verse... 
13 to 17. I don't know if this will work, but... So we'll look at Revelation 1. Verse 13 and 14. And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his feet and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in its strength. Who is this referring to? Who is among the lampstands? It's Jesus. This is a description of Jesus. Well, a very similar description here in Daniel 10. Christ himself, Daniel is seen. Now I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, while the men were, who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great dread fell on them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision. Yet no strength was left in me, for my natural color turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground." Then behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I'm about to tell you and stand upright. For I have been now sent to you. And when he had spoken his word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart on understanding this, and on humbling yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for how many days? Twenty-one days. How long had Daniel been fasting? Twenty-one days. That's why he said, from the very first day you set your heart on understanding this and humbling yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come. But he was delayed for the 21 days that he was working with the prince of the kingdom of Persia. Then behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Michael. Who is Michael? Who is Michael? Well, the word Michael, the name Michael, what does it mean? It means he who is like God. He who is like God. Well, there are references to Michael in the Bible. Jude 1, 9. I guess there's only one Jude 1. Jude 1, 9. There's only one chapter. It's got to be one. This is very interesting. Jude 1 9 says, <clears throat> But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. So here is Michael the archangel claiming the body of Moses. Now, we know Moses is alive because if you go back to the Mount of Transfiguration, there's Moses with Jesus on the mountain, right? So we know he's alive, but in order for him to become alive, Michael the archangel, whoever that is in here, is claiming, is being very proactive here. 
Okay. So if you look at First Thessalonians, which is one that we always talk about at funerals, right? First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians four. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The Lord himself is associated with the voice of the archangel. Is there some other archangel who says this? This says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, himself. Interesting that Michael the archangel is resurrecting Moses. It's the same function at the second coming, or quotes the second coming. All right, John 5. If you look at John 5. John 5, verse 27 through 29. Jesus is saying, <clears throat> Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. It's talking about the voice of the Son of God. Uh, go back to verse 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So he says, an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment or condemnation. So the dead are called from their graves by the Son of God. The voice heard is the voice of the archangel. Therefore, the archangel is none other than the Son of God. The archangel is called Michael. Therefore, Michael is the Son of God. So that's how we believe that Michael is, just from Scripture. Now, as we close... Verse 14, now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision pertains to the days yet future. And when he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. And behold, one who resembled a human being was touching my lips, and then I opened my mouth and spoke and said to him who was standing before me, O oh my Lord, as a result of the vision, anguish has come upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can such a servant of my Lord talk with such as my Lord? As for me, there remains just now no strength in me, nor has any breath been left in me. Then this one with human appearance touched me again and strengthened me. He gets touched three times. The first time is so he can stand. The second time, so he can speak. And the third time, so he can be strengthened. And he said in verse 19, O man of high esteem, that is Daniel, do not be afraid. Peace be with you. Take courage and be courageous. Now, as soon as he spoke to me, I received strength and said, May my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you understand why I came to you? But I shall now return to fight against the prince of Persia. So I am going forth, and behold, the prince of Greece is about to come. However, I will tell you what is inscribed in the writing of the truth. Yet there is no one who stands firmly with me against these forces except Michael, your prince. You know, you look at this, and Daniel was struggling. He was distraught. He was in mourning about the things that were to happen, the circumstances that it didn't seem like things were working out like he thought they were supposed to be worked out. And he was trying to understand. And I think Daniel 10 is a great promise and a hope to us. Have you been struggling trying to understand something and you're unable to stand 
something happened in your life and you're too embarrassed to stand, too ashamed, too guilty, you've suffered loss, so you can't stand. We've had a lot of people that have suffered loss recently. Struggling to understand. Or do you know things but you feel you can't speak up? Because you're afraid of the reaction? You're afraid of retaliation? You're afraid of rejection? You're intimidated? You don't have enough courage? Or maybe you're in a situation where you feel impotent, powerless, no strength, weak, like you can't make any difference. You're not important enough. You're too weak. You're too frail to endure. You can't do anything. You don't have any confidence. You think you lack credibility. Whatever it may be, just consider what happened to Daniel. If you humble yourself before God and really connect yourself with God, make him a priority, he will hear you the very t first day that the words escape your mouth. And he can touch you to strengthen you. He can touch you to help you stand. He can touch you to be able to speak. He can touch you so that you will be empowered and enabled to do what it is that he wants you to do. He does hear. He does touch. He does strengthen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your wonderful goodness to us and how you have given us and gifted us with so many good things. Not only in our just our abilities, our mental and physical capacities, but you gifted us with the Sabbath. You've gifted us with your son, Jesus Christ. You've given us so many good and wonderful things. And yet even through this, your enemy is pounding us discouraging us, dividing us, getting us to be disappointed, getting us to be ashamed, getting us to be fearful, to be anxious. And so as events occur in our lives and around us, whether they are in our control or not, you have promised to be there and you've given us assurance that you hear everything and know everything that's going on with us and that you respond, that the moments notice. You are there to strengthen us and encourage us, that you can touch us, that you have the power to help us stand, to help us speak up, and to help us be strengthened and enabled and given the power to do what you want us to do. May we continue to grow in our understanding of the truth about you, that we may really truly worship you in love and spirit and truth, because you are a God of love, a God of truth, and a God of freedom. May we be able to grant these very qualities to those around us. And may we seek to grow and enlarge your kingdom by telling the truth, the good news that has been everlasting from of old. That you are a good God. That you are not arbitrary. That the laws that you have created us to operate on are the laws of the universe, the universal laws. And that we must be brought into harmony with them or we will suffer the consequences of suffering and death. May we not be afraid of you but be afraid of what sin can do to us. And may we come to you, no matter what our condition, 
and that you can change us and bring us back into a relationship with you that will give us the, our highest sense of attainment and fulfillment, happiness, peace, and joy. And that is ours forevermore. And we thank you for that gift in Jesus' name who made it possible. Amen. Good morning. There's no one else in the room except for me and Ted Benson Jr. Uh, part of the reason for this is that we have a pandemic that's around us known as COVID-19, aka the coronavirus. This coronavirus has affected many households. It has affected the economy, the market, and really puts a dangerous sore note on the health of people within our communities. So the conference of the Seventh Day Adventist Church has made a response and has officially made a statement saying that all of the Seventh Day Adventist churches will be closed temporarily until the COVID-19 passes. This statement is obviously sad news for us to hear as many of us will not be able to attend church physically, but we still wanted to reach out to you and to be able to have devotional thoughts, ministry opportunities, and things that we can do even if we can't be face-to-face. -face. So we are going to be working on creating not only church service events like this that we can live stream and to get into your hands and into your monitors Sabbath mornings, but also in the midweek as pickups and different things during this stressful time. So we want to let you know that we are working to be able to keep the church active and present and that we can still be here as a staple place for you to be able to seek the Lord in many different ways. We also want to let you know that due to this, not just the church services, but other official church services, such as Pathfinders, such as the Wednesday night Bible study, the local pantry, and our health ministries, such as Vegan Gourmet and Diabetes Undone, are postponed currently. And that leaves our church open in that regards to uh, things that are not church official. And so we as a church are making a stance of saying that we are going to be closing our services, but that still leaves it open for you. If you want to do something on your own, if you want to host a Bible study at your own house, that's up to you. And that's it within your hands within your grasp to be able to get a hold of and to reach out to your friends, to your family and loved ones, and to still be able to study in the comfort of your own homes, even if it may not be here within this property. And I also want to remind you of one last thing before we get into a devotional thought this morning, that um, the church is still functioning. 
the church is still moving as we speak. There are still projects at work, and Suzanne and I uh, are still here at the church in many ways, and so we do still have a church ministry and a church functionality here currently. So our con- your contributions through offerings and uh, donations of tithe are still available. Uh, Adventist giving is still up and still active. And so if you want to still give for tithe, you still want it to go towards taxes and all of that, it is still available through Adventist Giving Online. You can still mail it to the church if you desire. All of that is still available. So even though church may not physically be here and we may not be collecting offering plates, that does not mean that the church is still not making payments and expenditures, and that also does not mean that the church uh, doesn't work off of funds. So if you still want to give your tithes and you want to know where to give it to, Adventist Giving dot org is still the website where you can go in and turn in local ties. That being said, though, I want to sh- shift this over to a conversation about the coronavirus. We've, m- I've mentioned it a little bit before. You've seen it in the news. You've seen it broadcasted left and right in all sorts of places. You've seen the economy and you've seen just regular life change and shift due to what's happening across the globe. And so today, as we're getting into this topic, I wanted to bring a verse to mind. This is really the scripture reading for this morning, and it's Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. And I will uphold you with my right hand. Today, as we get into this topic and as we talk about how the world is changing and we talk about stress, fear, anxiety, what's around the corner, let's not forget that God is with us. God will protect us and will hold us up with his right hand. Let's pray. Father God, I'm thankful for the Sabbath. I'm thankful that even though... Uh, There is a health crisis that is around us and is affecting multiple people, Lord. I pray that you be with us in this time, that we cling on to your promises and know that you are with us and that you will hold us up and protect us with your right hand. We thank you, Lord, for all that you do within our lives. And during this time where there is stress, where there may be adversity and conflict within the world, Lord, I pray that we do not forget that you are still right next to us, that you haven't left us, and that we are still able to ask you for help during these stressful times ahead. Please be with us, Lord, this Sabbath morning at our homes, in our cars, wherever we may be, Lord. Watch over us. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. So there is a high stress and a high anxiety over the topic of the coronavirus. Many people may be concerned about the actual sickness itself. As we know, the coronavirus does affect people that are up in age. We know that it affects people that show signs of diabetes. It affects people that have asthma. It affects people that have a previous history of smoking. It is definitely something that has been a scare within the community. But it's not just the sickness that is driving this fear, that is driving the stress and anxiety. As we saw this week, a lot of our grocery stores and different markets went on an overhaul of purchasing toilet paper and water. The uh, Both of these life resources have vanished within the grocery stores and different outlets, and now there's a scare of what's coming next. The stock market crashed a couple of days ago. It rose back up as, as the government has tried to impact it and has tried to keep it from a crash similarly to what happened in 1991 and in the 80s and even during world wars, but it's still there. 
The economy has definitely taken a hit. And many people are afraid today about what's happening next. You know, right now, if the toilet paper is gone, what happens when all the food is gone? What happens when we're quarantined into different areas? What's next in our lives? And so I want to talk about what's happening within this world and about stress, about stress, about fear, about anxiety. And what does the Bible tell us during these times? What is what advice did God leave behind for us and to counsel us with when things get rough? And as we're well aware that there's been multiple times in history where things have gotten rough, rough for all of humanity, rough for God's people. And so there is definitely lessons to be held within God's word that can help us during these times ahead. So I want to start off with God's promises that surround the topic of protection. We're going to talk about three major things today. We're going to talk about God's promises of protection. We're going to talk about God's promises to provide for our needs. And we're also going to talk about, our, about God's promises to protect us through healing. So we're going to talk about those three major topics today. Let's start off with the promise of protection. The first verse that I wanted to direct us to is Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy chapter 31, and we're going to be looking at verse 6. This is... In, in context of the verse, and in context within the chapter, this is Moses' farewell letter, and this is a piece that Moses is leaving behind for, the sit, for Israel, almost said as a city, but it's really as a nation. As a nation, they are about to go into the promised land. This is the last piece of their struggle within the wilderness. Joshua is about to take over as the new leader, and... Moses is giving, in his farewell, he's giving words of encouragement to them. And so in verse 6, he says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear, nor be afraid of them. The them that's being implied within this text is them being the people that they are about to go fight in the land of Canaan. The land that is promised to be theirs, they have an adversary, an enemy that they must face. Within, for us, it may not be a them in the sense of a actual person that we are afraid of or anxious about. But do not be afraid of this situation. Do not be afraid of what's happening. Do not be afraid of the circumstances. For the, for the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. We have a promise here. A promise that God will be with us. That God will oversee us and will protect us. And that's encouraging for us to hear. And this is one. Let's also go to our scripture reading that we had earlier today, which is Isaiah. It was Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Isaiah was constantly writing to the people of Israel. He was writing to them as a nation as they were about to go into this Babylonian captivity. They were about to be exiled from their own land that God had promised. They were about to be thro thrown into slavery, to be oppressed, taxed, and many other unfortunate circumstances that would befall them. And even within these texts where God is foretelling of the destruction of a nation and using an unrighteous nation to come in and to do it and to thwart them, he still brings them hope. He still brings them reconciliation within it. So even though he's bringing this, he still says, fear not, in verse 10, he says, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So even though there is darkness around them, even though there is uh, 
an evil nation in itself that's coming to destroy them, God still promises that he will protect them. He still promises that he will watch over them. Even though they're being thrown into a position where they may be slaves, even though he's throwing them into a position where they may be uh, taxed, severely punished, maybe even beaten in certain ways, God still promises that he will be with them. He still promises that he will oversee them. In this situation, there may be times where something happens where we may lose the ability to buy the food that we need, or there may be a scarcity of something that we, that we need. There may be times where we do actually get sick from what's happening around us. If that happens, we have a reminder that God will protect us during it, that God will still be with us even as we get sick, even as we may lose certain things that were a benefit to us before, God says, I will be with you. I will be right beside you. Another one that I have as a text that I have found is in Psalms. Actually, the next two that I have are in Psalms. One is Psalms chapter 5, verse 11. Psalms chapter 5, verse 11. It says, But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those also who love your name be joyful in you. So we have a text here that promises that God will defend us. God will protect us. He will watch over us. And it even says, let us rejoice, let us be happy. Even in this time where there's craziness that is around us, we can be happy. We can be joyful. We're still alive. We're still well. We're not sick. So we can be joyful in these things, knowing that God is with us. And the next one that I have, like I said, it was in Psalms, and that's Psalms 34. Psalms 34, verse 19. It's very short, but it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Notice that it, sa- it doesn't say that the wicked are the ones that are afflicted. It says it's the righteous. Those who are still in God's will, they're still hit with persecution. They're still hit with afflictions. Just because we're following God doesn't mean that we're exempt from what may happen around us. It doesn't give us an automatic uh, you know, visa to travel right through persecution or uh, to go through TSA without having to go through the security of sin, if you catch my analogy. We still have to go through it. We're still going to go through it. But God promises that he will get us through it. So in this there may still be outcomes that may look like, oh man, God, why is this happening to me? God, why did you let this travesty happen in my life? Why are they here? Well, they are. They are here. We may not know the reason why, but we know that God promises that he can get us through it. He promises us in 1 Thessalonians 3.3 that he will never bring us above something which we are not tempted to overcome we can handle the temptations that come to us. We can. Sometimes it feels like it's too much to bear, but we're still here, and we're still alive. So God will still be with us. He doesn't promise that the adversaries or that the afflictions will cease. As a Christian, the promise is that he will be with us as we go through them. So... That can be a difficult one to process. It can be a difficult one to accept. But this is what God says, and this is what God has promised. So that's our first topic, is the promise of protection. Those are four strong verses that help support these promises that God will protect us. And trust me, you can look online, you can just do a fast Google search of God's promises to protect us. You can find lists of 20, 30, 50 different verses that are supported of God's protection. You know, you don't have to go through Logos and through all these crazy softwares. You don't have to go through, you know, a 
you don't have to go through a concordance to try to find the promises of protection. They're right there at our grasp where God says, I will protect you. It's a very, it's a very a common theme within the Bible. The next one is providing for our needs. God promises that he will provide for our needs. And one of the verses that we can find on this is 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8, it says, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. This text is giving us a promise that God will provide for the needs of what we need to do good things, to do His will in many ways. And so, as we're looking at these texts, the, there's the, the theme of, pro, of providing, of provision, is that God is going to give us what we need. That God cares about us, and that He makes an effort to make sure that all of our needs and all of our requirements are met. In many ways, it's a reminder that even though things may be, may be tight, God does not forget us. God does not abandon us. He remembers us. So in this, God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things. It's not some things. It's not sometimes. It's all sufficiency in all things, and it's always that we may have an abundance for every good work. Another one is Second Peter. Second Peter. Second Peter chapter one, verse three. Second Peter chapter one, verse three, it says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. In this verse, it's, it's a twofold, really. It's twofold. Because first off, you know, as we're thinking about provisions, we're thinking about the things that we need to get by day, by day, by day, by day. And in many ways, Peter is talking about the need that we have and the all things that pertain to life and godliness. Peter is talking about the things we need spiritually day by day in order to get by. And he's referring to the things that lead to godliness through Scripture. So in many ways, God promises that he will provide for us physically, right? We were just reading in 2 Corinthians that God promises that he will provide for everything that we for all things that are ab- abundantly providing for good works. So there's something that he's providing that's physical, a physical uh, supplication. But here in First Peter, he's talking about providing everything that we need spiritually, emotionally, socially. Those, that, that component of what's happening within our minds, of what's happening theologically, theologically, what's happening relationally between us and God, Peter is promising that he also provides for those types of needs. He provides a way for us to be able to relate to God, to be personal with God, to approach God, and to be able to have community and communication with Him. So, as His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, scriptures, truth, his word, all of that, through the knowledge of him who calls us by glory and virtue. Just that phrase, the all things that pertain to life and godliness, is something that we can hold to as a promise. God has given us what we need physically, 
spiritually and emotionally. Another verse that I want to, to give to you is in Luke. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, we're going to read verse 6 and 7. And then we're going to skip down to 22 through 24. This really... This verse really talks about our value. Luke chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. It says, Are not five sparrows sold for two... (laughs) Tongue twist there. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore. You are of more value than many sparrows. So this section of Luke chapter 12 is really talking about our value. It's talking about how God values us in creation. We know that he specifically formed us out of his own hands and breathed into us the breath of life. We know that he made an effort to save us and to be with us. The plan of salvation is for us. It's made primarily and dominantly for the human race. And if there's a value of five sparrows and God doesn't even forget them, how much more does our Father remember us? And that's supported in Luke, in Luke 22 through 24. As I said, we would read it previously. Verse 22 says, Then he said to his disciples, Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouses nor barns, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? The verse continues on, and it really talks about value, about your self-value that God has for you, and how God considers you, and really treasures you. And in, in this specific section that we read, it mentions that ravens aren't able to store food. They aren't able to have storehouses. They aren't able to really provide for themselves. God still makes an effort to provide food for ravens, for all types of animals. And remember that ravens, it's not just that ravens a bird. Ravens were considered unclean animals. They were considered animals that were impure. You couldn't touch them. You couldn't go near them. Yet, it says that God protects even the unclean animals. God even cares about the low-value animal of a raven. If he cares about a raven, how much more does he care about you and me? How much more does he value us? Where he's making an effort to make us righteous and to make us clean and pure. How much more does he value us? I think that that's really powerful uh, to remind ourselves that God does care about us just like he cares about an unclean bird. So I think that those two verses are really a powerful promise that reminds us of our value and how much God cares about providing for our needs. Those birds don't have storehouses, yet God still provides for them and gives them food, though they're unclean. We have storehouses, yet God will make sure that we can provide for our needs on a daily basis. Now I want to get to our third topic, which was the promise of healing. Like we were reading before, God doesn't necessarily, you know, automatically get us through all afflictions before they happen. Sometimes afflictions do come upon us. Sometimes adversity, transgressions, all these different things are right at our fingertips, right at the door. And sometimes we have to walk through it. You know, as it's raining and has been raining for the past couple of days, you got to walk through the rain and you're going to get wet. But God promises to get you to a dry spot. 
So, we may get sick. Something may happen to some of us where uh, we, get a, you know, we get the cold and we fear that it's corona. We may get the coronavirus. I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I'm just a pastor. But God promises that even in those moments, even if we do get sick, God does promise healing. In James, it would help if I went the right way. In James, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15, it reminds us of our duty as a church when people get sick. In verse 13, in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. This is a beautiful promise to us and an action in which we can partake in to be able to go to someone who is sick, to go into someone who is in need. And it's through faith and it's through our prayers and our requests that we make known to God that he answers them according to his, to his will. And so we have a, sur- a surety that God will provide for our needs. And if we are sick, we can gather together when the person is sick and we can pray over them and we know that God will will heal them if it is within his will. Another verse about healing, which I think is interesting, is Exodus. Exodus 23. Exodus 23, verse 25. During this time, God is giving the rules and the decrees of Israel to Moses. He's telling them of what's to come, how Israel is meant to respond as a nation, how they're supposed to act, what they're supposed to uphold, different feasts, different festivals, observance of the Sabbath, many different things. And so he starts this list of what the angel of the Lord promises to do as they're going through the wilderness, as they're traveling to find the promised land. The angel tells them multiple things that he's going to do in verse 23. It's surrounded by things like miscarriages. There will be no miscarriages. Um, There will be um, confusion amongst your enemies. They won't be able to attack you because they'll be in a disarray and they'll turn their backs on you. Uh, He promises that he will drive out the people that are against them. And, you know, he gives all of these assurances of what he's going to do. But in verse 25, he specifically says, says, so you shall serve the Lord your God And he will bless your bread and your water. And I will take sickness away from the midst of you. In verse 25, the blessing that he has promised to give the Israelites is through the food and the drink that they have. He promises that it will give them good health. It will provide for their needs as they travel throughout the wilderness. But not only that, here he says... I will take sickness away from the midst of you. So sickness is still there. Sickness is still present and prevalent for Israel. But when they are sick, God promises through the angel, through the messenger, that the sickness will be taken away. The sickness will be pulled out from them in that regard. So we can be reminded that the promises that were held up to Israel were carried out and true. We know that there was the bronze serpent that was put on a post that whenever people could look to the serpent when they were bitten and poisoned, that by looking to it, God would remember them and would heal them. We know that, you know, it didn't immediately stop the snakes in the sense like he didn't just pull out their venom. They still got bit. They still got poisoned. God's promise healed them from the poison. So we have, two, we have a twofold here. We have a promise to protect us from afflictions and from 
adversity, but we also have a promise to heal us once we've been sick. You know, it doesn't always promise that we will never get sick. It's there. Another one that I have is Jeremiah. I really like this text. I think it's really powerful. Jeremiah 17. 17 verse 14. It's very simple. This text is simple, but it really reminds me of what was said even in Isaiah and what we read earlier in Psalms, especially Psalms chapter 5, verse 11. For here in Jeremiah 17, verse 14, it just says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. It's a request to be healed, a request to be saved, and then he rejoices. Just like in Psalms, when it talked about um, protecting me, he says, you know, I will enjoy, I will rejoice, and I will lift up your voice and praise you, for you have defended me. It's very similar to here, where he's saying, heal me, like, you know, as I'm sick, as, as there's troubles around me, save me, heal, save me, I praise you. I rejoice. Those three things are really something that they have in common. We rejoice and we provide testimonies of when God heals us and when he saves us. We also praise God when he, when he saves us. Really, within this diversity, it's not a time for us to be scared or stressed or afraid. It's a time to remind ourselves that God will protect us that God will oversee us. We don't have to worry about tomorrow. We don't have to be anxious or afraid. God's promises within the Bible, within the Old Testament at the very beginning, within the middle with the prophets, even in the New Testament, in the Gospels, and the promises to the church after Jesus ascended. All throughout the, the history of the Bible, God promises to protect and to provide for his people. We have an assurity of that. And so today, as we are amidst a pandemic, as many of us may be nervous to go outside and fearful of what may happen, my prayer is for wisdom and for discernment within this time, but a reminder for us that we don't have to be afraid of what's happening. Don't be reckless. I'm not telling you to be reckless and to be crazy in that regard. But I am saying we don't need to be afraid of the coronavirus. We don't need to be afraid of being sick. We don't need to be afraid of the economy. We don't need to be afraid of grocery stores that are completely going out of stock. We have a promise that God will protect us. We have promises that God will provide. And we have promises that God will heal us. So, my challenge for you today, when stress arises and when adversity seeks itself out and we feel ourselves being afflicted and oppressed within our own system, don't be afraid. The Lord your God is with you and will not forsake you and will uphold you with his righteous right hand. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for this Camarillo community. I thank you for their willingness to serve you and for the constant dedication they have to seek you out, Lord. It's encouragement for one another, and it's encouragement for me. And so, Lord, I pray that you be with us as we go through these times, as uh, people around us are getting sick, as um, we're locking ourselves into our houses, as people are afraid to go out into the regular community life, Lord. Be with us and help us to cling to your promises, to your word, to the scripture that reminds us that you will not forsake us. 
that you cherish us and value us, that you provide for us and you heal us when we are sick. We thank you, Lord, for these promises. And we can't wait till we can meet again within the sanctuary. But ultimately, ultimately, Lord, we can't wait for you to come and take us home. Thank you, Lord, for your promises. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to leave you with a reminder. Uh, stay connected to your emails. Continue to look on our website. We're going to be trying to look for uh, different ways that we could potentially stream during the week of devotionals and weekly thoughts. And we're also looking for ways that we can provide uh, more information for our Sabbath schools and for weekly services. Stay tuned. Check your phones. I may be calling you and sending you emails. Uh, so God bless. Have a wonderful Sabbath. And I'll see you soon.